Welcome, Sam. What's up, man? How are you? I'm doing pretty good, man. It's uh, it's good to finally get you on here. Uh, still testing out the the Zoom features and uh, getting used to using this. Um, but uh, welcome to the podcast and of the the video. And uh, so we wanted to talk with you about your um, your nonprofit. I keep wanting to call it a business, but um. So technically, nonprofits are businesses, so. <laughs> well, you know what I mean. Yeah. All right. Well, you take it from here, and uh, tell us what you do and uh, how you got into it. Sure. So, well, first, thanks for having me. Um, sorry it took yeah. so long to get on here. No, um, so, I'm the executive director of a Charlotte-based educational nonprofit called 100 Gardens, and we implement aquaponic farming programs in schools to teach STEM, entrepreneurship, environmental sustainability, healthy eating. And um, we do it all through hands-on learning. And um, so, and that ranges from um, K through 12, all the way up to adult prison systems. And essentially the suite of services that we provide is that we build aquaponics facilities, and then we design curriculum and develop curriculum and then we train the teachers and staff at all the schools and facilities how to implement the programming using the curriculum, and then we support them throughout the year, teaching activities with the students. Um, and then we try and wrap up the school year with a big fish fry that uh, then we'll harvest all the fish out of the tanks and take the students what through what it means to kill animals and, and what that is all about, and um, just try and make learning as, as real as we possibly can. So. That, that in a nutshell is, is what 100 Gardens is. Nice. Well, um, I guess uh, just to start things off, some people may not know what aquaponics is. So I was going to say, uh, what is aquaponics and how is that different than hydroponics and aquaculture? Because those are kind of two, um, two things that may be pretty, uh, people may get mixed up. Um, right. And it's kind of like, to me, it's more the combination of the two to create a closed loop system. But how would you say? Yeah, so um, that's usually the first thing I have to do is define aquaponics before I even start telling people what we do. Because um, even though it's becoming more mainstream, especially like your audience probably knows for the most part. But what aquaponics is, and actually the word came from the other two words you talked about. So mm -hmm. aquaculture and hydroponics, you put them together, you get aquaponics. So that's where that word actually comes from. Mm -hmm. um, and essentially, um, I, a lot of people view uh, aquaponics as hydroponics, which is growing plants without soil. Um, but instead of using the chemical fertilizers, you use the wastewater from fish tanks. Mm -hmm. um, I actually look at it more from the fish farming side of it. So I view aquaponics as a way to farm fish without discharging all those wastes into the environment. And you use hydroponics as the, the, um, the waste treatment, essentially. You use, you use the plants as the waste treatment. So with aquaponics, you grow edible freshwater fish and tanks, and then you grow plants, and the fish tanks provide nutrient-rich water to the plants, and the plants use up those nutrients, returning clean water back to the fish. And at the end, you get uh, edible freshwater fish, and you get vegetables. And it allows you... Um, the reason it's really important is because right now our oceans are what's called a state of collapse. So we're only 30 years away from a complete collapse of nearly every major seafood species. Um, so it's getting pretty, pretty hairy now. And we have got to take pressure off our ocean species if we want to sustain those animals for our grandkids to be able to eat one day or just to do the right thing and be a steward of our environment. So... To me, the way we do that is we farm fish on land so we can directly take the pressure off of our wild species. When you really think about um, farming, we only farm things when we run out of them in their natural abundance. That's the only reason we have to figure out how to create them. So, you know, the reason we farm cows is because, you know, 10,000 years ago, we ran out of wild cows to eat. So we started to have to learn how to breed them. And then that's where, you know, animal farming comes from. So... Fish are the last thing that humans eat that are wild, really, except unless you're going out and hunting yourself. So now that we're running out of those, 
fish farming is now the next frontier and aquaponics is a way to do fish farming without, um, without the negative environmental impacts. Now, uh, I've, when I was building my own aquaponic system, when I was studying, it seems like there's a pretty, uh, narrow group of fish that are commonly used. I know tilapia is the most common. Uh, I've seen koi fish. Uh, I use goldfish. Um, is there uh, obviously, uh, aquaculture, uh, the goal is to be able to like grow a wide range of aquatic life. Is there any limitation to what, you know, obviously you can't really do salt water fish. Um, Correct. It, can you do pretty much any freshwater fish with this kind of system? Is there limitations or do you have to kind there, of stick there, with tilapia yeah. and stuff? Well, there are limitations for sure. What I want to make clear to people is, as excited as I get about aquaponics, it is not a silver bullet to food production. It is one piece of a complex infrastructure of various food production systems that are needed in the future. So we still need organic soil growing. We still need hydroponics. We still need all these things. Um, the limiting thing about aquaponics, and it's not just aquaponics, it's really aquaculture, um, is that we have not had the time to domesticate these species the same way that all the other animals that we raise, we've had that time. So the cows that we're farming now, those are a result of us selecting genes in cows for 10,000 years now. We've completely taken the wild animal out through our breeding programs. And um, we haven't done that with fish yet. So you, it, you, that's why you can't take, you know, a zebra out of the wild, stick it in a feedlot and have a bunch of zebras that aren't gonna get diseased and die. They have not been domesticated to take that kind of environment. So aquaculture, um, especially aquaponics, is very limited. It's the only domesticated species that are really sustainable to grow from an environmental standpoint are tilapia and channel catfish, carp, which most Americans don't eat, but is widely eaten around the world, um, trout are becoming more, one of the next frontiers for aquaponics. There's a place called Superior Fresh, and I think it's Wisconsin, and they're, do, they're the first Atlantic salmon uh, production facility in, in the United States, it's not just aquaponics. They're the first inland, in tanks, Atlantic salmon producer in America, and um, I think just um, their fish farm has hooked up to 30 acres of glass, uh, glass greenhouses. Mm. That, that's real, that's aquaponics, that's the future stuff there. So, um, but before we get off that subject, the reason that um, tilapia is really the main thing that you see in an aquaponic system is because uh, one, it's really easy to grow, two, it's widely accepted as a food fish, and three, they are the most environmentally sustainable fish to grow pretty much because they feed low on the food chain, so they can eat a plant-based diet and be just fine, whereas when you get into the carnivorous species like trout and salmon, they need a higher percentage of animal protein in their diet. And that animal protein is coming from fish meal because that's what they can best absorb. So we're still pulling fish out of the ocean to grind up, mix with soy and corn to feed the trout. So even though it's a net positive on the ocean, it's not nearly as sustainable as a tilapia, which can have a very low percentage of its feed be any kind of fish. Yeah, tilapia is like the, the chicken of the, of, the, of the water, I guess. It's just like you could do yeah. it. It can take yeah. a beating, whereas <laughs> the other ones are more sensitive, right? Right. And for those who are really interested in tilapia or are confused about the controversy around it, because there's a lot of people who are afraid to eat it, um, mm -hmm. the Canadian public radio, whatever their NPR, I think it's called CBC, they have a podcast series called uh, The Fridge Light, and it's stories about all the foods you never wondered about. And they have a whole episode on tilapia and how it emerged in the United States and how it grew with Applebee's and Applebee's as they were starting out in the late eighties, early nineties, only had like five locations and tilapia was the only thing that had a stable price point all throughout the year. So they went with tilapia and everybody had tilapia the first time in America at Applebee's and as Applebee's exploded, so did tilapia. And that's how we became to know that fish. Now, now we did a video with you already. Um, you know, people can watch that. Uh, that was more focusing on like sh kind of showing off the system. Um, this is kind of delving more into stuff that's hard to, um, I mean, you know, that's not as visual, but, um, I was wondering, like, I know you're not as much into this, but like, if someone was wanting to do this commercially, like, 
would you, when I was researching it, tell me if I'm wrong is like, um, what, what side of the system? Cause I was thinking, Oh, the, the fish would be more profitable, but, um, I was reading that the plants, uh, because the, the turnover time, you can harvest them very quick, the plants. And then it, by taking the fish out of the system, if you were doing it like for profit, it's almost, it was, they were, what I was reading was that it was better to keep the fish in the tank to keep the balance of the system and maybe selectively use it and use it more for the plants. Is that totally wrong or? No, you're right. I mean, the, the profit comes from the plants. Um, is it hard so, to keep the balance of the system when you're consistently harvesting the fish? Like uh, as far no, as the nitrates really. and stuff goes? Well, that's a good question. And it comes from, you know, if you harvest all your fish at once, then you lose your fertilizer source for your plants, right? Or if you harvest all your plants at once, then you lose all your filtration for the fish. Mm-hmm. So um, you remember at Garinger, we had four fish tanks. Um, reason the different we have life stages? Tanks. Yeah. And so we can, mm-hmm. when a, when a tank is ready to harvest, we're only harvesting 25% of the population out. So our, oh. nutri- our nutrient load is always going like this all year. And um, it never goes, you know, 25% less than a stable thing at one time. So we create like a gradient of, of nutrient values all throughout the year. And every six weeks we're pulling the tank. Um, so we, we are able to maintain an average daily feeding rate, even though we're harvesting tanks at different times. Would the market for that tilapia be more specialty like, oh, this is kind of like a very more niche? Because I heard that tilapia, like, I heard they almost use, they, I heard it, a lot of tilapia is grown in like prisons or places like where you can't even compete with like the prices almost, like, because they do it yeah. so cheap. Would it be a more niche yeah, market well, probably? It'd have to be. It, it's the difference between um, buying $2 a pound pork chops at, at Food Lion and then going to the farmer's market and paying 20 bucks a pound. I mean, it's the same difference. Um, you get, just got to find people who are willing to, to pay more for a premium product, even though it's the same species they're growing. Um, I guess where you kind of join the profit is that you're getting two feed stocks out of the same system. So you have two revenue streams and nothing's going to waste and you're not having to buy as much food. Like, cause the, the fish, you're just feeding the fish and then that's feeding the plants. So um, you're saving on fertilizer for the plants and then a lot of different things. So the efficiency of the system maybe helps get the price down a little bit. Yeah. Although I'll be honest, it's a, it's not cheap to run a commercial aquaponics system. Um, yeah. If you're going to do aquaponics, it's not because you're trying to save money. It's because you're trying to save the planet. So it can be profitable, but the margins are smaller. Um, and you know, you have to drive a high price point. So if you're going to grow an aquaponic system, salad greens, you're not going to want to price it the same as iceberg lettuce coming from food line. That's getting grown on a hundred thousand acres in Yuma, Arizona. You'll never compete yeah. with that. So you're going to have to be the top of the line that, and that's not just um, aquaponics. See, that's small farming. Small farms can't compete with big farms. You have to, to charge more. So, um, but aquaponics right now, is what I consider to be a transitional technology. I think it's gonna get more popular and more popular and more popular, but what aquaponics ends up being by the year 2050 won't look anything like it is now. Do you think it's scalable or do you think it'll be part of this transition I think we're moving towards as I think things are going more decentralized with like blockchain and all these different things. Um, I I can maybe Mm -hmm. see like a community size aquaponics system and maybe it's networked together with like I, IOT or like where they're com- communicating with each other or something like yeah. you're talking about networking data, right? Yeah. And I, I think you're right. Like I could almost see rather than it being a joined facility necessarily, I could almost see someone sets up um, an Atlantic salmon facility and then someone, you know, right next door sets up a huge hydroponics greenhouse and it's more functions as a circular economy where different uh, industries are working together to use each other's waste streams. It might not just be like one system that's together. It mm. might be two industrial scale systems that are using the products from each other. And I think that might be a more realistic way that it goes to scale in the future. Cause I think community size is right. Like um, I think I could share my screen. Do you mind if I show you a picture? Yeah, 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 sure. So um, what I want to do is show you sort of like, the last thing we build is pretty much semi-commercial size. Um, I don't know 
know if you've ever seen these pictures or not, but uh, all right, I'm sharing my screen. Do you see that there? Oh, yep. So that's the one that we built um, in collaboration with the Berkshire County uh, House of Corrections in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. um, that I think is about the the starting size for a successful aquaponics operation. They produce 1,500 heads of lettuce a week, and um, they'll do about, I think, five or 6,000 pounds of fish a year. And I think that's enough. If you were driving $3 a head of lettuce, you know, you're talking $4,500 a week um, in revenue. Um, so I think that's about the scale right there. That's a 72 by 72 greenhouse, um, 72 square feet or 72 feet by 72 feet, whatever that math is. But I think that right there is about the scale where you can get to it. Um, get to a something that makes sense so the jump from um hobby to making money it's a pretty good jump yeah um as far as are, are there particular systems that you think are more profitable like do you think the you you were highlighting the benefits of the floating uh the raft system compared to uh some of the other types of of aquaponics systems. I, I like the system w once you really explained it that, that you guys have. Uh, I, I toyed around with hydroponics. I used the flood and drain system. I used an NFT system with gutters. That's more for hydroponics. I guess you could convert that to aquaponics. Um, but as far as I guess uh, the contact the roots have with uh, good bacteria, that's probably the better system you think? Well, I think they all have their merit, but raft system, the floating raft system works better for both plants and fish than the other systems work for either one of them, because the plants will thrive in almost any environment. If you can get nutrient rich water running past plant roots, you can grow them in, you know, a brick wall, you know, if the roots can fit through the crevices. Um, so, but with the fish, imagine this. So you have um, in any given footprint, you have fish tanks and then you have the hydroponic system. And let's say an NFT system, the only water that's in those NFT pipes or the gutters is that tiny stream. So all of your water is in the fish components. Now, if you have a floating raft system, think about how much water is in that floating raft. So you just increased the water amount in your system in the same footprint by almost double. So we actually have more water in the plant component than we do in the fish component. So the size system that you saw at Garinger High School, that has about 3,000 gallons of water. That same system set up as an NFT would only have 1,000 gallons of water. And you're saying that's a bad thing for the NFT? I'm saying it's a, not a bad thing, but mm -hmm. think about water volumes and fluctuating temperatures and fluctuating nutrient oh, values. Yeah. The less water you have, the faster it heats up, that kind of thing. So in mm -hmm. terms of keeping great health of fish and plants, the, the raft systems are so stable in terms of water conditions, they move very slowly. And that allows you to um, have really stable conditions that can, um, you just get really predictable results. Uh, also um, for NFT systems, um, they can become clogged in aquaponics because the mm -hmm. feeder tubes are too small and there's a lot of bacteria in an aquaponics system and you'll get what's called biofouling in your pipes, essentially like getting heart disease, your, your arteries start clogging up. That's what happens to the piping in, in an aquaponic system. So um, the raft system is one huge, huge pipe that can never get clogged, essentially. What, how much water does that use? Uh, I mean, you have to originally input a lot of water, um, but compared to traditional farming where it just runs off, um, how much can re you reuse that water? How much evaporates off? How much do you have to top it off? Um, we replace about 1% of the water per day. On, 1%? On yeah. So on that 3,000-gallon system, we lose about 30 gallons a day. Um, what, from evaporation? Mostly from evapotranspiration, which is the plants drinking it and releasing it as water vapor uh, through their leaves. So the plants are using most of that. Um, that's They're running through. Those lettuce plants are running through about 30 gallons a day just to grow. Um, that's where most of the water loss is. There's a lot of claims about, you know, 90% reduction in water 
usage compared to field agriculture, but there's no, there's not enough trials and studies done to actually substantiate that. So I don't want to push out information that might not be totally accurate. Um, but we're able to recapture a lot of water. Um, I so mean, you can, I think you can safely say, I, I think you could safely say it uses less water because it's recycling it. And then you're not using all the fertilizers and having all the runoff into the streams. And so, I, I mean, I think it's a net positive. You could probably say that. Yeah. And I think also you get more production. So you're getting more plant mass for the use for the water you would use. Um, so you're producing more. When you think about like, you know, the plants pretty much grow unimpeded for their whole life cycle. You know, there's no disturbance. They get all the water and nutrients, CO2 in the atmosphere, oxygen in the root zone. It's just constant all the time. And then, you know, if they're not growing right, um, you know, you haven't set up the conditions properly, essentially is what happens. Um, what a lot of people ask me is how do you grow like really nice plants? And I tell them you don't, you don't grow plants. They grow themselves. You have to create conditions in which they grow really well. Yeah. Um, you know, plants are the only thing that you can do in your life that will give you more than what you put in. So if you're growing a cow, you, you're going to get less back than you put in. Yeah. You're going to have to feed it more than what it gives you. Uh, plants are the only thing that turn light into um, actual biomass. So they, you will get more. I mean, fungi are like that too. They're not using light, but you will get more than what you put in. But um, so that's something to think about. What are the biggest variables to think about? Like if you had to chalk down like what people should be the most concerned about when they're thinking about um, what factors do I need to think about and control in an aquaponic system? I mean, our video explains the different things. Um, I mean, my, my understanding from doing it, you know, you, you have to start this process that goes from, uh, I think it's nitrates, nitrites, no, ammonia, nitrites, nitrates. Um, and that kind of starts this biological system. Uh, I was constantly checking the pH. Um, the plants need nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Um, what I think magnesium is another thing you test for. Like, what would you tell people? Because um, there's so many things. Like, I have this book right here. This is a good book, I thought. It's very simple. Um, it breaks things down, but still it's kind of overwhelming all the different things to think about. So what, if you had to chalk it down to a few things to really think about, what would you say is the biggest factors? Right. Um, well, the amazing amount of information out there makes it um, difficult for people to know what information to trust. Um, so the first thing that I would do is find the document. Um, Pulling up here, I'm gonna share my screen with you again. Go for it. This, 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 uh, your aquaponic nerd viewers will love this. I hope we have uh, some of this. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So this document, all you have to do is Google SRAC. You'll see in the top right hand corner of this document, SRAC publication 454. Mm -hmm. That is the Bible of raft aquaponics production. That is the University of the Virgin Islands 16 page doc that tells you how to design the system to the gallon, to the square foot, how to plummet, how to do everything. Um, and it has guidelines that you need to follow for each day running an aquaponics system. And they have what's called their eight guidelines um, to successful production. And essentially, it comes down to um, comes down to designing a system that's already been proven, whether or not you're going to do a raft system or a media-based system. So one thing you don't want to do, because you can't follow any guidelines if you've completely created too many other variables. You know, so, that's like I started with vertical aquaponics at first because I thought it looked sweet. <laughs> yeah. Well. <laughs> so, and you can do it any way you want, but, um, it didn't work that well. <laughs> here's the thing. Um, there's what's called a, um, feeding rate ratio and the university of the Virgin islands, they figured this out over 30 years of research and development. And it comes out of this. You have to feed your fish 60 grams of fish food 
per square meter of plant growing area per day. It's the first thing you gotta do. So when you're thinking about a system, you gotta start with how many plants you're gonna be growing in terms of square footage. Mm -hmm. So let's say you gotta grow um, two square meters of plant production. Uh, uh, so that's 60 grams of food per square meter per day. So you gotta feed 120 grams of fish food per day to grow two square meters of plants. Then you gotta figure out how many fish do I need to consume 120 grams of fish food per day? And if you're just a hobbyist, that's about 3% of their body weight per day. So you take 120 grams, you divide that by 0.03, and that tells you how many grams of fish you need swimming around in that tank to consume that amount of feed. And that's the basis for how you design a system. Start with plant growing area, figure out what the daily fish feeding requirements are to fertilize that amount of plants, and then design a fish tank that can hold those amount of fish. If you're in a hobby system, that's about one pound of fish for every 10 gallons of water is what I would do. Commercial stocking density is one pound of fish for two gallons of water. So you wanna be around one pound for 10 gallons of water. So that's first thing, start feeding at a ratio that is made for plants. Two, um, for RAF aquaponic systems, you have to remove the solids before they get to the plants. So you have to filter the water before that water gets to the plants. And when I say filter, I just mean grab the solid particles out of the water before they get to the plants. So just flowing through filter pads, essentially. Um, and then, then you have nutrient rich water that is free of particles that is nourishing those plants growing. So there's two things, remove solids, feed at a rate that, um, that supplies enough nutrients for plants. The third is um, you have to maintain your pH at around 7.0 and your pH will always be dropping in, an, in a healthy aquaponics system, always. Reason being is that the process you were talking about, which is called nitrification, which mm -hmm. is the conversion of ammonia to nitrate by bacteria, mm -hmm. that process, those bacteria consume alkaline, al alkaline ions and so they're dropping the pH. They're making the, the solution more acidic as they perform nitrification. So your pH is always dropping. So you have to make, you always have to bring your pH up using two different things typically. And those two things are calcium and potassium in basic form. You can either use carbonates, which release slow, or what we use are hydroxides. So we alternate the use of calcium hydroxide and potassium hydroxide. Reason you have to use those two is the fish provide um, 14 of the 17 nutrients needed for plant growth. The the three that they don't provide enough of is calcium, potassium, and iron. So we can supplement calcium, potassium in basic form by adjusting our pH. So you get both those things done at once. Mm -hmm. And then we add iron in, we test for iron and we maintain a level of iron at two parts per million in the water. That's all you gotta do for nutrients, essentially. Um, keep feeding at a rate that supplies that amount of plants, raise the pH with calcium, potassium, and supplement iron to maintain a rate of two parts per million in the water. That's the basic how you aquaponic sort of guidelines. Um, the next thing is if you're doing this for a hobby, it, basically all things go, just grow anything that you wanna eat. But the things that perform the best um, for anyone that just has a garden at all, if you're low on space, you wanna um, grow things that are expensive and things that cost the most at the grocery store tend to be highly perishable items. Potatoes aren't expensive because you can ship them around in the United States for a year and they're just as good when they came out of the ground as when you get them a year Root later. Root vegetables don't do good in uh, aquaponics, right? No, they don't. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, they can in like media-based systems. Is there right, a concern, because uh, I took a class out in Statesville and the guy was saying that there might be some concern with like the fish bacteria and like root vegetables. Like, is there, is that a valid thing? Could be. I've never heard of it, but um, I know who you're talking about, and I don't think he would spread misinformation. So no, he was he was legit. Yeah, he was a good guy. The yeah, yeah. Stall hat farmer. Yeah, he's cool. I like him. <laughs> I took that course. It was a good course. Yeah. So he, um, I think if he were to say it, it's probably pretty valid. Now he might have just been expressing concerns for things that he didn't say it for sure. Had. He said he had concerns. He said he would not do root vegetables. Oh, okay. Like carrots uh, I, and peas. I wouldn't either, just because I know they grow better in soil anyways. Um, mm -hmm. So, 
but in general, you want to grow high value, highly perishable stuff that make a difference um, in your grocery bill, and also you get the fresher stuff. So, Sam, how do how do you inoculate your system? Next up, start the the ammonia nitrate process. Um, well, uh, generally, we just add ammonia to the water, pure ammonia, and we let the bacteria find it. So that takes like 30 days though. If you want to do it fast, we just buy concentrated bacteria, um, and you add that and then you feed it pure ammonia, ammonia hydroxide. I, uh, I, I did the poor man's inoculation. Did you pee in the water? I, I peed in a bottle and poured it. <laughs> oh yeah. People it try works. that. Huh? People try that. Yeah. It works. Um, so, uh, it, it will work. I mean, nitrification happens everywhere. So. Well, it's, yeah, it's ammonia. So. Yeah. So, yeah. So that's kind of like the tips. The main thing though, going back to your question, if there's anything I can give people for advice mm -hmm. is read that document. SRAC publication number 454. That and that will document. give you, that will give you everything you need and it's free. Your taxes paid for it, by the way, because it was mm -hmm. produced by a land grant university, which our taxes fully paid for. So use it. It's ours. Do you have like a reputable YouTuber or book or um, it, like resource that you, somebody you look up to a lot in the space? Yeah, a lot of people. Uh, mm. So like the Paul Stamets of aquaponics or something like that. <laughs> right. Um, well, there's a lot of people I look up to. So all the researchers at the University of the Virgin Islands, um, like Dr. Um, Jim Ricosi, he's the godfather of aquaponics. I trained with him over a weekend short course um, when I was 24, that was eight years ago. Um, he was really nice. I looked up to him in my younger years. And then one of his co-researchers, Charlie Schultz, is still very involved in aquaponics. And I was able to first meet him at the aquaponics conference in Kentucky last year. Super nice guy, super available. There's an aquaponics conference? Yeah, hosted by the Aquaponics Association. This is that a yearly thing? Yep. Um, people come from all around the world. So wow. uh, it was well attended and um, met some really great people. So Charlie's another one. Um, a guy that doesn't get much credit, who's probably more important than, I want to say more important, but might be more influential than anybody, is a guy named Merle Jensen. Um, Merle Jensen basically created um, plastic culture in the 50s where you put plastic on the field to heat up the soil and then the plants grow through the holes in the plastic. Um, he increased cantaloupe production by 10 times over per acre, inventing the plastic sheeting. Um, and then he turned into the hydroponics guru in the 70s and did the first hydroponics commercial greenhouses in Abu Dhabi in the middle of the desert. And they used a big desal plant to strip all the salt, water, salt out of the water and they grew food in the desert. Um, and that was huge. That was, he was on Time Magazine for doing stuff like that. And then he was hired to start the Controlled Environment Agriculture Center, which is the best in the world at the University of Arizona. Um, so if you ever want to learn how to be a commercial tomato producer or anything in the hydroponics field, that's where you go. And when he was doing that is when he was hired to design the land exhibit at Epcot Center, where they have the huge um, hydroponics exhibits. And they just had their 300 and 310 millionth visitor go through the hydroponics exhibits at Disney World and Epcot Center. And um, so he's like the guy. If there's like any guy who's done more for the industry, it, uh, it's Merle Jensen. I, I know you used to work at a, a hydroponics store. Did, have you uh, converted any of your past hydroponic friends to or coworkers to uh, get more into aquaponics? No, not really. They, we stay in touch, but um, I was always kind of the outlier because no one's really interested in food production in those stores. It was all about growing weed. I went um, in there and they, they kind of get a kick. They immediately were like, oh, you need to talk to Sam. Yeah. That's, that's how I got referred to you. For, was <laughs> yeah. So um, I haven't really converted any of them. You know, aquaponics is not something you do. Um, you have to like catch the bug. I mean, you really do. It's expensive. It's time consuming to get into and to learn. I mean, you really got to believe it to really get into it. And um, for a lot of people that were in hydroponics initially, aquaponics was, is a lot to take on. 
Have you ever basically cut and paste now? So, <laughs> have you ever thought of like partnering with like App or uh, Warren Wilson or one of those schools? Uh, they have like big sustainability programs. Uh, I've considered it. Um, I haven't not done it for a reason. It's just never come up. We've done a little bit of work with NC State, um, but nothing, nothing big. Uh, I mean, they've got so, like a biodiesel lab. They've got wind wind labs. They've got uh, solar labs. I mean, I, I feel like they would be they would be pretty into that sort of thing. They had a really good sustainability. I think App would be great, and and Warren Wilson is that Nashville? Warren uh, Wilson, yeah, that's in Asheville. It's in uh, Swannano or Black Mountain. Uh, no, okay. Swannano. But um, yeah, like I mean, they've got like a farm. Uh, I've, I've been wanting to hook you up with uh, my friend. She works at a Montessori school down in uh, uh, south of here, and sh- she would she would love to have you out at her school. She's gonna be on here and talk about like beekeeping. She runs the farm in a Montessori school. So, what school like, is that? Uh, it's it's the one with uh, Nicole. Nicole used to work there. Remember? Is it Davidson Green School? I think so. You know Nicole, yeah. the hydroponics lady that uh-huh. now grows like pot or something. <laughs> She's growing him. Yeah. Um, yeah. She's cool. That's yeah. That's. What's actually funny is they um, when I went to Connecticut with her and a bunch of people from Friendship Gardens four years ago, and we we're all getting drunk in the in the airport together, and then we get on the plane, and I end up sitting beside this um this dude with a look like just someone who I would not be friends with, <laughs> and you know big big brawny manly dude. Mm-hmm. and look like a cop so i'm sitting there talking to him and um we just started shooting the shit about college football i don't know why but i like college football so we started talking he asked me what i did and i started telling him about the program i teach at the juvenile correction center and he introduces me as the sheriff of berkshire county massachusetts and that's why we got that huge contract up there so it was on a plane ride with nicole to a conference four years ago I meet a random guy and now that's the biggest project we've ever done. It was from that random conversation I had with that one guy turned into our biggest project ever. You never know who you're going to come across. I, I, I got a kick out of it when I saw his pictures. It's like all these sheriffs and then this <laughs> hippie guy. And like, I was like, that's awesome. That's pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, yeah you, you really never know who you're going to come across. Um, trying to think if like, what would be your biggest tips to somebody that, um, was thinking about getting into this. I did want to ask, um, do you have any favorite types of farming that are, if, if it wasn't aquaponics, uh, what other types of farming do you kind of really look up to? I, my personal favorite is permaculture. I, I did like a permaculture certificate and, um, I mean, I like hydroponics too, uh, vertical farming and all that stuff. But, uh, do you, do you kind of have some favorite types and, and maybe why, like what, what do you, advantages? I think it's kind of a combination of a lot of different systems that's really going to get the job done. Yeah, me too. I think, I guess I can't really say favorite. I don't think that anything is more sustainable than um, permaculture um, guided organic farming. I just think that um, that is the area in which we can make the most progress. Um, however, I, I do feel like the high tech solutions the the, here's the one thing i think where it's gonna go and then i'll get back to the original question i think where it's gonna go is you're gonna see um organic production done in the most sustainable ways inside of controlled environments because the controlled environment is what allows for the rapid rapid growth and the consistency of production and the water savings so you could take like you know, organic fuel production that's done really sustainably, you put that in a million dollar per acre greenhouse and you will triple your yield doing the exact same things. So um, that is one thing that I think the industry's going. If I could pick, like if I wasn't doing aquaponics, um, I'm really into, there's two people that uh, kind of inspire me. There's a guy named Curtis Stone, the urban farmer. Who's got oh, it. I follow him. Yeah. The, so reason I like him, he's kind of like, Vancouver. Yeah, he's in Canada. Mm-hmm. Uh, he doesn't grow a whole lot of different things because he sorted out what he makes money on. But 
he's got the best approach to if you want to try and do this thing for a living, here's how you can do it for like under $5,000. And here's business plans and here's how I did it. And I think he is awesome for, for showing the world how to do it like that. He's developed a system which he's refined, but it was more invented out the French intensive method, which then was taken up by Jean Martin Fortier, who wrote the um, uh, the Market Gardener, which inspired Curtis Stone to do his stuff. Um, the shipping container and the microgreens and all that kind of stuff. No, I don't think so. Um, I'm trying to think who that was. Okay. But um, there's an aquaponics guy that he does it in like Canada somewhere, and he uses. Uh, like plastic tents and he pumps air between these poly layers to super insulate it. So it seems a lot cheaper than like a glass. And then yeah. he has these giant aquaponic tanks, but he does vertical systems. Oh, okay. He has yeah, them um, hanging and then he pulls them off to harvest. Yeah. That double, um, that double poly is pretty standard practice. Um, mm. uh, so, Cause he showed like snow outside and he says he barely heats it. He's like, we got a foot of snow outside and like those things, it was still staying super warm. It's so insulated. Yeah, you can do that. Actually, the greenhouse you went to, um, that plastic siding, that's a twin wall. There's an air gap in the middle of that siding too. Oh, really? Um, so it's about this thick, uh, and it has two pieces of poly with an air pocket in the middle. Um, so, all right, so Curtis Stone is one. The other person who I'm like sort of at a distance, um, nerdy garden crush have is – she has a YouTube channel called Asian Garden to Table with a two. Mm -hmm. And she's like a middle-aged Chinese woman who moved to Florida and is the most kick-ass gardener you've ever seen. And she grows everything. Pumpkins, potatoes, cucumbers, tomatoes, um, onions, bok choy. And she shows how they do it back in her, um, her wherever she came from in China. And um, she is just like super informative and I recommend that channel for anyone trying to do some true like backyard food production. She knows how to maximize yields in the backyard. Unlike anything I've seen and her plants are perfect. Like, you know, when she has plants lined up, everything is just perfectly uniform and totally orderly. And um, mm -hmm. I've always been a sucker for that kind of precision when it comes to farming. I heard of something. I had it written down. It's a, um, Michael Smith, have you heard of him? He does this, like, I, I saw something about this, like, thing he makes. It's something with biochar. He does something with algae and biochar. I think they, they use it for farming. Do okay. you, know anything, you know anything about biochar? Like using No, I, I know what it is, but I don't know enough about it to, to talk about it. Um, I, I have fun talking about kind of the, the, the stuff that's, like, not maybe not used as much, but uh, – I think it has, I, there are people that use it. I don't think there's many applications for aquaponics. Uh, but I, like, I know that there's, like, a soil mixtures that are coming out um, that have biochar included in the soil mixture. So you got to have some kind of value that does something cool. Is there a way with hydroponics, though? Like, for somebody that wanted to set up a hydroponic system and didn't have the full capabilities to go aquaponic, I mean, could you use something different? I always hated the fact of going into the stores and getting the liquids, um, it just didn't feel like natural at all to me. Like, could you use something like a worm castings or like a, a compost tea or something like that instead? Um, uh, I don't think so. Um, because the principle with hydroponics is that you're bypassing all the biological and meta, meta, um, metabolic processes that create nutrients that plants can use. So in soil, what happens, plants do not use, by and large, organic nutrients. They don't use them. They use inorganic nutrients. And what happens in soils is that, let's say you apply manure to a field or compost, um, bacteria in the soil take that compost and they mineralize the organic materials and release inorganic nutrients into the soil. Those inorganic nutrients mixed with the moisture in the soil creates what's called the soil solution, and that's what plants use. So hydroponics, you're basically saying, screw all the metabolic and biological processes. We're going to give them those inorganic nutrients that we just went and mined out of the earth rather than waiting for bacteria to convert them from organic sources. So 
Um, if you're gonna you can, do, like, have the bacterias, like, break it down somehow and, like, make some possibly, sort of compost tea, though? Possibly, but it would have to be regenerating itself over and over to supply the amount of inorganic nutrients needed, I think. Um, the thing that makes hydroponics very efficient is, like, you know, when you're going into a hydroponic store, they're going to tell you, you got to switch out your nutrients every two weeks. We want you to buy more, buy more, buy more, buy more, use more chemicals. That's how they make money. But in a big hydroponics facility that does true commercial production, they're not changing out the nutrients. They, every week, send it off to a lab, and they send back what micronutrients are missing, and then they replace those tiny amounts at a time. And they're saving all that water over and over. They disinfect it. They recycle it. So it's very efficient. It, mm. the, the industry so does not look like... On a small like, scale, it's very inefficient. And then these big companies. Yeah. Um, now, if you want to do hydroponics, um, you want to buy powdered fertilizers that you mix together. The best hydroponic channel for home growers is a guy called um, MHP Gardener on YouTube. Um, he's got 4 million views on his tomato Dutch bucket system. I mean, I'm, I'm not kidding. This guy's out of Virginia, good old boy. And um, he is a master of hydroponics. And he uses, he tells you how to mix up the fertilizers. He buys these big 50 pound bags of like tomato fertilizer um, and mixes it with calcium nitrate and, and um, you know, a couple other minerals. And uh, it comes out at like one one hundredth of the cost of a liquid fertilizer. Um, after you mix it all up so you, with um you know a big fat bag of fertilizer like three or four fertilizers that you mix up together you know you can grow thousands of pounds of food um so even though it, it sounds like you're using chemicals um if you do it right it, it really gives you a lot more than you put in hmm. that, i mean that's that's pretty interesting yeah so um but organic hydroponics as far as i know has never succeeded on a on any scale as far as I know that's all I know though because there, there could be something out there but um, the thing that's interesting you're saying there's not a really clear pathway to kind of having sustainable hydroponics aquaponics permaculture more sustainable you're saying hydroponics kind of by nature until they maybe find some other way to catalyze a breakdown of things better or something then yeah like um, I think Hydroponics is limited in theory by the amount of minerals that we can pull out of the earth. That's mm -hmm. what limits that. Um, aquaponics works as a organic based system because the fish are constantly producing nutrients all day, all night. They're constantly producing them. So you have a constant, like the, the nutrient values in an aquaponics system are about one fifth of what they are in a hydroponics system. Yet the growth is the same. And it's because they're using nutrients as fast as they're produced. Whereas hydroponics, you just keep a stable base the whole time. Um, so there's a lot of phenomena that we don't really understand yet. Um, and um, I'm not smart enough to talk about most of them. I just know a little bit yeah. about what I do. So. I, I think some of the people that follow us will be excited to hear the aquaponics because I did, I did a blog. I didn't want to just jump straight into aquaponics. I thought a good base was doing a hydroponics blog. And I, I posted that and I got lots of kickback on Oh, hydroponics is, is, is terrible for the earth and all this kind of stuff. And I was like, I'm, I have a permaculture certificate and like, I've, I'm, I'm actually way more into aquaponics. So, uh, I mean, I, I'm glad well, the, amount actually, of, the amount of, you know, it, the internet is great, but it also gives the idiots a voice. So you have to watch out. Uh, the, uh, the if thing, you put one thing out, it's like, that's, it's kind of like, that's all they see. So. Uh, you and I mean the biggest battle I've ever fought doing what I do. The only negative thing I ever get is why oh, you got to grow tilapia. You know that's the thing. Um, so I get a lot of people who go, oh, isn't that a man-made fish? And I'm like, no more man-made than every pig, chicken, cow, radish, and cucumber you ever ate. Uh, you, you know you can grow freshwater lobster, right? I did not know that. I did know about the. I the, looked the, into the, it. The, the Malaysian uh, river prawn. Those are pretty big. Uh, uh, I don't. I don't think they're economically viable, though, because they're they're cannibalistic. Um, I guess to wrap things up, like what what do you what do you think are some of the biggest um, 
problems, I guess, that you can have with the plants uh, to look out for, and then what are some issues that can come up with the fish. I think uh, we, we kind of talked about um, some of the different elements and the positive positives of things. How would you identify if you have a problem in your system? Right. So um, our sources of issues over the year, the only fish kills we've ever had were typically from a power outage. Um, and Aeration? Back in, uh, yeah, aeration, stop of aeration, stop of flow. So like in the wintertime, if a greenhouse or a school isn't hooked up to backup power, you'll you'll go there and be a bunch of dead fish the next day. You need a battery problem, bank. Yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> we're working on it. So, and then that snowballs out of control because if you don't get the dead carcasses out fast enough, um, they will start to decompose in the system and that releases a whole other set of negative pathogenic bacteria that can take over and cause harm for months. So there's one thing is um, backup power, highly recommended. Um, also, like I'm mostly a vegetarian, so I still have the um, ethical part of raising animals that I take really seriously. And every time I've lost fish, it's really hurt my soul a lot because you raise these animals in captivity and, you know, by your, by your supervision, they suffocated a slow death and you found them dead and it makes you feel bad. So, um, so I, that backup power is, um, one thing. Um, and then solids removal is something people don't take seriously enough. You want to remove fish poop out of the water and then keep all the water. Um, and you can do that through a variety of filtration devices, but a lot of people get hung up on the fact that if they take the fish poop out, they're losing nutrients when the reality is 70% of the nutrients are already dissolved right out the fish and only 30% are locked up in the fecal matter. And the more fecal matter you leave in your system, the higher what's called the BOD, and that's biological oxygen demand. Meaning now there's so many bacteria breaking that feces down, they're stealing oxygen from the fish now. The bacteria will outcompete the whole system for oxygen. And you'll just, everything will go anaerobic. And that's when you lose fish and plants. So remove solids, remove solids from the water frequently. Um, backup power and then follow the follow the guidelines laid out by the University of the Virgin Islands those, those are the things I would do every single time we have clients or someone that says my system's not going right they skipped one of the eight guidelines every time <laughs> it's like you know just do it do what people who figured it out told you to do that's what I've learned every time I've had a failure ah oh, damn I forgot to do number six you yeah, know yeah well uh, I want to thank you for joining us. Um, I want to give you the floor for a second if you have anything to say uh, to our billions of followers. <laughs> <laughs> soon, to, soon to be. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, yeah. Thanks for um, thanks for having me on. I would encourage people. Um, the best way to fix your carbon footprint that you have control over is to change um, your own life and, and how you participate here on planet Earth. So. Uh, growing a garden is a great way to reduce your carbon footprint. Eating less animal products is a great way to do that. Um, so it starts with us, starts with us all, always. Um, you know, I'm as, um, I have my political beliefs, but when was the last time government solved the biggest issues of our time? Uh, so we really have to do it as people. And we have to align ourselves with other people who believe in doing the best things to the planet and the human species. So, um, that's kind of how I'll leave it. I encourage everybody. I don't care if you're doing regular gardening or aquaponics. Um, always put the why in front of the how, in front of the money. Figure out why you're doing it, and then everything else will fall in place if you believe in the why enough. If um, if anybody wants to help out with uh, kind of the mission of 100 Gardens, or um, do you know any other? Are there like regional groups for people that live in different areas of the country, like? How, how can they help 100 Gardens, and are there other groups doing similar things? Sure. Um, best way to help us is um, take our message, which you can find at 100gardens.org, um, and take the videos and the documentation we have there and share it with people in other schools. Um, we also like donations, but I'll just be very upfront about this. A $20 donation is really great, and we appreciate it if you do that because that's what you got. However... If you were to sell one of our programs and introduce a school to our program, that's going to raise us more like thirty to fifty thousand dollars. 
So the best thing you can do for us is to help us impact more young people. And that's how we fund our own missions. So if you know educators, principals, administrators, concerned parents who are part of strong PTAs, introduce them to the Mission of 100 Gardens and, and that will be enough for us. I, I think what y'all do is more critical than ever. I think with this whole uh, COVID thing, I think we've kind of seen, uh, people are starting to see kind of like, oh, uh, you know, like what are our kids learning in school? And I think people are kind of going back to, um, you know, we can't all just be computer programmers. Like, and I really liked what you showed how Hunter Gardens, like, or like building an aquaponic system really brings people from all kinds of different trades. I mean, while we do need the high tech, you know, as you know, there's people going into different things, something like aquaponics provides jobs for all kinds of different things, blue collar, white collar. Um, and it really gets kids a hands on education, like, and, um, uh, lets them kind of get back to the earth in school. And I think that really like gives people, gives kids a better mentality and fights depression, all kinds of things. Yeah, I think so too. That's why we do it. Well, thanks, Sam. Yeah. Hey, thanks you. Uh, thank to you. Thank you. Word's not coming out right. Uh, but yeah, keep up the good work, man. I appreciate you having me on. Yeah, man. Re- really appreciate it. Thanks for your time. Yeah, man. Have a good one. See ya. All right. Thank you.